solution for. There is no reversal of that disease. There is no cure for that disease. There is only treatment for that uh, chronic disease that maintains more or less the status quo and may, uh, however, does not avoid the inevitable uh, demise and the uh, uh, lack of uh, uh, life uh, quality that continues to occur until the inevitable death. So uh, what's, what's actually being damaged here in the lung? The lung relies on what we call the air sacs. These are uh, millions, about half a billion, uh, of the air sacs inside the lung that guarantees us the ability to uh, respire, to breathe, to exchange oxygen and CO2. These are the alveoli that are composed mainly of uh, specific cells and a matrix. We call them the alveolar cells. And uh, uh, we, uh, there are other cells, uh, of course, such as the mesenchymal stem cells. And uh, very important is also the capillary system that feeds into it that is based on endothelial cells. The attempts to uh, uh, treat uh, uh, these degenerative diseases where the alveoli or the air sacs are uh, very much damaged, uh, preventing regular uh, respiration, was uh, done on a successful, in a successful way in animals. So we were able to regenerate uh, these structure in animals such as rodents to a a uh, partial degree uh, using, for example, mesenchymal stem cells. And uh, uh, there have been, uh, following that, uh, a lot of clinical trials that attempted to do that in humans. And unfortunately, all these failed. And there were several explanations for their failure. Uh, one of them, uh, or some of them, are related to the type of cell that has been used because mesenchymal stem cells actually do not survive in the body after injections. The, uh, the vast majority of them die out. And uh, uh, other reasons uh, relate, of course, to the delivery of these cells. The cells can be only delivered, in this case, using uh, intravenous injection. So you'd, uh, instead of targeting the, uh, the lung directly, you actually systemically inject uh, mesenchymal stem cells. Uh, there are other reasons that uh, relate uh, also uh, to the failure. Uh, one, for example, is the inability to produce a lot of these cells uh, in the lab uh, so that uh, we can uh, use them on human subjects uh, in abundance. So uh, what we think is that uh, the, this failure can be, uh, avoid, uh, can be avoided by using a different type of cell, and that's where the SMS cell comes into place. The SMS cells, uh, it's an acronym for small mobile stem cells. These cells are actually quite uh, uh, small. They are uh, transparent. Uh, they can hardly be seen. They are quite motile, so they can be confused with bacteria. And that's why uh, the, no investigator were able to distinguish these cells. The cells are in diameter about four to five micrometer. And uh, they, uh, uh, as you will see later, they are actually quite potent uh, and quite e efficient. Um, in fact, when we studied these cells, uh, we, we recognize their advantages, being accessible and present in peripheral blood, regular blood, being actually uh, uh, readily cultured and proliferating quite, uh, quite strongly in the lab. So 
we could solve the problem of availability. Uh, they also are very responsive to signaling molecules. Uh, that is always a signal to the biologists that they are important uh, cells in the development and the regulation and the homeostasis of the uh, body. The other thing that is quite remarkable is that these cells interact with specific uh, cells that are key to regeneration. One of them is mesenchymal stem cells. Another one is alveolar type 2 cells, which are quite involved in regenerating the alveoli, the air sacs that I mentioned before. And uh, that was a strong impetus for us to study uh, the value of these cells in terms of therapy. The cells also are able to differentiate, that means change to other type of cells. Uh, they are able to form nerve cells given enough time and uh, they are able also to form bone cells and fat cells. So similar to mesenchymal stem cells, they have the ability to differentiate and we call them multipotent. They have, however, other ability that mesenchymal stem cells cannot uh, present. Uh, one of them is uh, being able to form a structure, a complex structure. This is one of those, uh, those two are uh, examples of this uh, structure. These are way bigger than the cells. We're talking about a diameter of 130 micrometer vis-a-vis -a, -vis a cell diameter of four or five micrometer. They can align in a very regular shape. Uh, that's all in culture, in vitro, using only SMS cells. The other aspect of that, uh, of those tiny cells, is their ability to produce a lot of proteins. And we analyze these proteins. These proteins are of, uh, of big value, known value to heal. And uh, another uh, aspect of these proteins is their ability to induce blood vessels. Blood vessels, which is angiogenesis, uh, of, uh, are essential for the regeneration of tissues. And uh, we see the formation of small vessels, but also the formation of bigger vessels. That green line here represents actually uh, the, uh, uh, a vessel, a bigger vessel that can be seen with the naked eye. So we are the only one actually who can reproduce uh, these type of vessels that are visible by the eyes uh, 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 using, uh, using a, a culture system uh, in vitro. And I will uh, uh, play a short video to demonstrate that. This is to the right a blood vessel that has been formed from endothelial cells induced by the SMS cells. We took these, of course, we can take those vessels and put them in a tube and study them farther. Now, when we compare the SMS stem cells with other stem cells, uh, such as embryonic stem cells or adult stem cells, uh, mainly uh, mesenchymal stem cells, we see clear differences. So compare, uh, when we compare SMS cells with, uh, with embryonic or iPSC cells, uh, there is the aspect of safety that is important. Adult stem cells, such as the SMS cells, are quite safe. When we transfer these cells to a human, it's adult cells to an adult person. We are not transferring an embryonic uh, cells made for an embryonic state into a human. So there is no danger uh, of forming tumors or teratomas. 
Uh, the other aspect is related to the other uh, adult uh, stem cells. Other adult stem cells have a problem with potency. If you grow them for long, uh, they lose some of these characteristics that they have. We don't have this problem with this uh, type of adult stem cells. The other advantage that, is, that makes them actually very practical for treatment is the fact that the cells are quite resilient and they are quite small. And we will see later why is that so crucial. So uh, this is an example to demonstrate how, how strong the binding of the SMS cells that are stained in green uh, uh, to the mesenchymal stem cells. Once you bring them together, you actually stain the mesenchymal stem cells uh, with these green SMS cells. And the, the, the strength of binding is for any biologist an indicator that actually there is something happening. And that's why we checked the gene expression resulting from that, and we found that indeed, uh, the SMS cells can not only bind and not only stimulate the proliferation of mesenchymal stem cells, but they also change the gene expression of mesenchymal stem cells. So instead of giving patients mesenchymal stem cells, we could give them SMS cells and they will stimulate the endogenous, uh, endogenous uh, mesenchymal stem cells in patients. And that's already a big achievement. Okay, I wouldn't go through that. That's too technical. Uh, but this is here another example of what can be done with SMS cells with, with another key important uh, cell, such as the alveolar type 2 cells. Alveolar type 2 cells are the key ingredient for the regeneration of the air sacs. they actually called progenitor cells because they create the alveolar uh, type 1 cells. And what we see is that exposing these cells in vitro to SMS cells actually enhances their proliferation and enhances their proliferation in the absence of serum. And that's important because many of the damaged tissues in the lung have no uh, blood circulation, they have no capillaries, and they actually are in need of that. So being able to stimulate that proliferation is an incredible important step in the process of regeneration. We checked also the gene expression changes. Indeed, 1,300 genes were changed by SMS interaction with these uh, cells. And the changes are consistent with healing. The changes involve lowering inflammation, reducing apoptosis, which is cell death, enhancing pathogen protection, something that happens to many COPD patients. They get attacked by pathogens, which cause exacerbation and causes enhanced uh, uh, enhanced damage. So we have a promotion of angiogenesis, we, uh, the building of blood capillaries. We reduce also vessel permeability, one of the problems that induces inflammation. And we reduce blood, fresh, uh, blood pressure inside the capillaries within, uh, within the lung, which is also extremely important. So what, what else can be said about that? How about delivery? How can you deliver these cells in a targeted fashion to, uh, to the lung? Of course, uh, having these tiny cells being resilient give us the idea of trying to uh, push these cells through a nebulizer inside the lung. All other cells will die from the process of nebulization, of inhaling, creating a mist uh, containing the cells and uh, having the patient inhale it. In this case, it was different. 
the cells actually survived the process of nebulization, which means that future patient can actually inhale these cells and they can act directly into the lung uh, uh, and uh, they can act locally without systemic interaction with other organ as would be expected in an intravenous injection. So we tested these cells in animals. The most important thing is to prove safety. So when we actually injected large amount of human SMS cells into the rodents, uh, we, we observed no adverse reaction whatsoever. We did that in two different ways. We injected them systemically through intravenous injections and we in, did that also directly to the lung through installation. In both cases, no adverse reaction whatsoever. So that was great because that means we can really apply probably high amounts of these cells to the patient to capture an effect. So the second question is, are they really able to treat uh, animal models in vivo? Are they able to regenerate these air sacs? And for that, we created a rodent model, a typical model of emphysema. That means uh, we damaged intentionally this air sac by destroying it using an enzyme. So, and uh, that creates these big openings that you see to the right, right? The big openings means that the alveoli were destroyed and now you have uh, larger areas of air occupying uh, that surface. What we tried to do is actually adding the cells after that process of damaging and seeing whether adding the cells would revert that process of damage. And this is what actually happened we were able to convert the big holes that you see to the left in, and uh, to this nice crowded area with air sacs, uh, proving that we were able to regenerate alveoli and uh, regain the original structure. And we were able to do that with a percentage exceeding 60%. So, uh, how did we do that? We, uh, we did that using one injection of the SMS cells and waiting for only one week. So, using one injection and waiting for only one week recovered more than 60% of these alveoli uh, air sacs. Uh, we did also a functional test of these rats, letting them run. So we had the, uh, the, this trade. <laughs> uh, like a normal rat, after uh, destroying uh, the alveoli to a large part, you know, when you check a human being for COPD, you let him walk. So, treadmill action is very important. And uh, the full functional recovery, more than structural, uh, uh, and the more than 60% structural recovery was achieved with these animals. So, what are we waiting for? We are waiting now for uh, our first clinical trial in which we're gonna use a nebulizer to access the lung directly and expect the cells, alveolar type two cells and the mesenchymal stem cells to be proliferating and uh, 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 to induce the genes that are essential to healing.
For that, we produce trillions of cells in the lab. And uh, these, uh, these cells are so resilient that, contrary to other cell therapies, they do tolerate being, staying, uh, being in the refrigerator for about a week or 10 days. Now imagine, we can cover the whole world with these cells within that period of time without having to go through free freezing and thawing as other people have to do with cells. So, uh, what do we have here? Human small mobile stem cells. It's a next generation stem cell regenerative therapy that involves no genetic manipulations. We're using normal cells, natural cells. Uh, we have a direct route to the lung. We have a multi-targeted orchestrated process for regeneration. We have an off-the-shelf cell therapy. You don't need the blood of the patient. We produce these cells in large quantities, and patient can order these cells from us, like any medicine you have in the shelf. Uh, we're targeting chronic widespread diseases. Definitely, uh, other targets can be targeted too, such as uh, COVID-19 long haul patients, or maybe uh, lung fibrosis. We're looking into that. So the aim is actually to cure, not merely to treat. And that's what should be our aim for the next 4.0 uh, health system not to maintain the patient in a chronic state consuming medicine, but to cure that patient. And we can do that definitely using more knowledge about regenerative medicine. So I would like to see SMS cells in the space of Health 2.0 with your help. Thank you. Any question? Okay. Yes, first of all, amazing topic. This is really fascinating. Uh, I was just curious about, uh, I know a lot of it was focused on uh, repairing things similar to COPD with gaps in the alveoli. Uh, do you see any potential applications for things similar to COVID or other respiratory viruses where the lungs are being actively filled uh, with inflammatory or uh, lymphatic fluid or whatever it might be, but something other than active damage, but improving the, the overall health and capacity. Do you think there might be applications there? Yes. Uh, frankly, uh, the fact that we enhanced and went quickly to the lung as a target was also promoted by the COVID-19. You know, we were hoping we can deliver something uh, for the acute damage. Uh, however, I think uh, uh, we decided later that uh, maybe we should look for uh, an indication that's more prevalent and, uh, you know, and uh, more stable, maybe uh, not excluding, however, potential for acute cases of treatment. I see, for example, the potential of lowering inflation and pathogen protection as a, as a real potential for acute, uh, uh, acute uh, solutions to acute uh, respiratory attacks. Uh, however, um, there is some medications that I think can take care of that. What I'm worried about is, like my friend, one of my friends who is, by the way, a stem cell expert, uh, I think he tried to avoid getting the vaccine for some reason I don't understand. And uh, he knows how to protect himself, but he forgot that he has children. So he got infected, lost about 60 to 70% of his lung because of that. So 
I, unfortunately, we have many cases like that, and we really need the, the solutions for that. Now, there is also a relationship to uh, mental illnesses, you know. If you have lack of oxygen, you are more likely to be affected by dementia later on, right? So uh, I see the correlation definitely with other solution. I, I, I may not be able to ascertain that this is an agnostic treatment, but it could be, you know, because it's based on a most likely a natural regenerative process that we are not quite familiar with. Yeah. Thank I you. hope that answers your question. Fantastic answer. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Dr. Shintani from Hawaii. Is there application to this for pulmonary fibrosis? Yes, uh, that's an excellent question. You know, uh, when we checked the gene expression changes, some of them are related to reducing fibrosis. Now, uh, I was discussing with our advisors uh, and supporters, uh, whom we owe a lot, actually, uh, uh, this item, you know, why should we care about uh, that item? We're trying to learn from the cells. So reducing fibrosis is actually inherent in the mechanism of healing because when you regenerate, you stimulate cells, and you may stimulate also, uh, for example, fibroblast, and cause fibrosis as a side product of regeneration. So it was, in my opinion, and their opinion, it was a very intelligent system of stimulating cells while making sure you inhibit fibrosis. Uh, at the same time, to prevent uh, the, uh, the excess of fibroblasts or the formation of fibrotic tissue, the extracellular matrix uh, uh, that could be damaging to the lung on the long run. So it is possible also that we can target the lung fibrosis by itself. We, didn't deci we decided not to choose that as the first indication because we wanted uh, a widespread indication. Uh, uh, lung fibrosis, as you know, is more or less a rare disease. Thank you. Thank you. OK. OK, thank you for the organizer for giving us the chance to uh, present this topic.